Hello and welcome to The 77%. My name is Edith Kimani and this week we have such a special edition on our show where we're talking about how we, the youth, are being affected by the changes in our environment. Coming to you from the scenic Lake Bogoria National Reserve right here in Kenya. Coming up on the show, we hear from Vanessa Nakate, a young activist from Uganda who has joined the global climate movement. We find out how a Maasai community in Kenya is adapting to climate change. And in Lagos, we meet young people on the beach and what they're up to might surprise you. We're here, as I mentioned, at Lake Bogoria, which is a saltwater lake in Kenya's part of the East African Rift Valley. Scientists are, however, warning that an ecological catastrophe is imminent if the water levels here continue to rise. As we speak, the lakes in this area are at their highest level since Kenya's independence in 1963. The water levels have been rising here for years, but extreme weather patterns and usually heavy rains and human activities have made the situation even more dire for the people living here. So I spent some time in the area and spoke to residents who explain how their lives have been affected by these climate anomalies. Lake Bogoria, so swollen from rising water levels that the shoreline changes every day. We see this early on in our trip when the access road unexpectedly becomes part of the lake. Nearby, we find Chelagat Kipchumba, who's just arrived to open her bar and restaurant. But there's been a dramatic change. This water just, this water just came in within one so day. You, so it came slowly, slowly, slowly until it got to this level. So without any so notice, without no notice, you have to demolish within just a few seconds. Chalagat has already been forced to move her business once. It's inevitable that she will have to move again, and she's not the only one. The structure we're looking at is an entry point that was erected by the Kenya Wildlife Service after their original gate was submerged by water. It only took three months before the lake eventually caught up with this one, and we can clearly see that this water is unrelenting. What we can't see, but we can certainly smell, is the sewerage that's also being brought with it because obviously people here use pit latrines and all their contents are now underwater and the water is clearly unrelenting because all around us the ground is soggy and there's little lagoons all over the place. The extent of the flooding can be seen clearly from neighboring Lake Baringo. The freshwater lake has expanded by 60 percent in the last seven years. This year has been by far the worst. Fox, our tour guide, grew up on the shores of this lake. Work has been scarce, as most of the hotels are now underwater. He leads us to one of many flooded schools in the area, revealing an eerie scene of decaying buildings. But our last stop is the most significant for Fox. I grew up here. My first 20 years of life, I spent it here. This was my playground. It's quite sad to see it all gone to ruins. Don't know what I'm going to tell my kids. We're here on top of Lake Baringo to investigate what scientists have called an ecological catastrophe in waiting. The lakes around the Great Rift Valley region have been rising dramatically. And what you can see behind me is actually one of the effects. These are homes, hotels, hospitals, and schools all drowned by these disasters. While some say that it could be tectonic shifts under us which are causing this, most people argue that this is actually an effect of climate change. Scientists are warning that freshwater Lake Baringo and saltwater Lake Bogoria could merge. The cross-contamination would destroy the balance in the ecosystem. To understand what is happening to the lakes, we head to the forest. Home to the rivers that feed the lakes in the Rift Valley, Mao Forest is recovering from years of deforestation. David Weston has been a conservationist for more than 50 years. He says that destruction of the catchment areas is just one in a series of linked problems. The pastoral people are now settling down and staying in one place. So what that means is every single day you have heavy grazing. And that is really prominent around the Baringo Basin up in the hills on the side, so all of that erosion is being washed off routinely. So in 2018, we had rainfall, <coughs> which was the equivalent of El Nino in 1998, then followed last year 
by these extraordinary rains which have continued for a whole year. So that means degradation, huge amount of runoff and siltation. And it's the combination of those two that have made these Rift Valley lakes and even other areas like Amboseli just lift 10, sometimes 15 meters. Back in Bogoria, a storm breaks. It's short, but ferocious. Chalagat is visibly worried, and soon her worst fears are realized. The water level has gone up again. This could be her last day on this land. It's the following day, and construction has started on higher ground. This is where Chalagat's new home and business will be. It's a fresh, uneasy start. No one can be sure the water won't rise this high because no one believed the water would ever get as far as it already has. All right, so we've heard from people here how the rising water levels have affected them. And with me is Mr. Henry Leparillo. He's actually a farmer. It's his farm used to be at least just a couple of meters from where we are. And I wanted to find out from you, Mr. Leparillo, how has your life changed since the water started coming into your life? Actually, uh, we have been having a problem, this problem of floods for a quite long time, since the beginning of this year. Uh, uh, this water started from around seven kilometers away, and a lot of people have been displaced. How, how far was the lake originally the before? It has been around 10 kilometers from here where we are standing. Wow. In fact, uh, uh, from the, where we are sitting, where we are standing here, we have just a uh, school here, Nampo mm -hmm. Secondary School, mm -hmm. which has been just uh, fully submerged. We also have uh, around 4,000 people have been displaced. Mm -hmm. And uh, a wall, uh, where we are standing is a Ngambo, Ngambo, Ngambo location, yeah. Ngambo sub location. Yeah. Our whole sub location has been fully submerged. Wow. People have been displaced. So we have internally displaced persons within this sub location because of these water levels. Yeah. Um, but also your harvest. You told me that you very quickly had to go into the water and get your maize when the water was up to here. Yeah. What are you doing about your livelihood? I mean, that was your harvest. Uh, we just uh, try to harvest a, a very small number because of the we have also, we have animals yeah. which were being a very very threatening people. Mm -hmm. Not even to to harvest uh, those the small meters we have tried to get. Yeah. Uh, people just uh, we have this this water destroyed a lot of a lot of farmers here. So your homes your means of life uh, but I can see that there's a gentleman here who's fishing is this now what you're doing because you started off as pastoralists then the weather was bad there was drought you decided you were to become a farmer sure. and you now see. you you're becoming fishermen you see we, as our community we used to be pastoralists but because now we have this lake which and there is a fish here, there is a lot of fish here Unfortunately, there is also wild animal, hippopotamus, there is crocodiles. But because of drought, people have a lot of problems now. Don't have food, don't have shelter. But the only thing you can get now is these things, this fish. The fish. So people just resort to fishing, but not all of them. Some very few individuals who just, uh, although we don't like doing fishing, but because of poverty, you're forced to change your way of life. Yeah. Okay, and finally, you talked about hippos and crocodiles. Is this something that you're having to deal with, human-wildlife conflict? How close do the hippos get and the hippos, crocodiles? Hippos are just around here. So in this water, as we speak, there's yeah, hippos? Yeah. speak now, there is a lot of hippos, there is a lot of crocodiles all along here. People are very much threatened. People are live in worry. In fact, what we are doing now, we want to urge people not to come close, very close to here especially at such a times like this one, because those animals are very, uh, they are very much, uh, they no normally come out of water as at such a time like this one. Mm. So there is a big problem. There is a wild human to wildlife conflict. Well, Mr. Henry Leparillo, we really thank you for your time. And I'm really sorry for what is happening here. Thank you. Now, while people here are trying to come to terms with the changes happening here, many of us are adapting our lifestyles to the changing world around us in smaller ways. Further south from here in Narok, we met Selina Nkoile, who told us about how she, and particularly the women in her Ma community, are adapting to climate change. Selina Nkoile lives in Mosiro, a small settlement 140 kilometers west of Kenya's capital, Nairobi. 
she wants to raise awareness about climate change in her Maasai community. Long droughts and unpredictable weather conditions related to climate change are one of the biggest challenges the Maasai now face. Climate change has seen us experience like longer droughts than we used to before, but now it's hard to predict rain or predict even the weather. The grazing lands are becoming more scarce. It's forcing the Maasai to keep lesser amount of cattle. So climate change has really made the Maasai be forced to move from being nomadic pastoralists to looking for other sources of income. The option of moving to greener pastures has always been the basis of the Maasai's way of life. But now, sustainable agriculture can be a solution to address nutrition security in the Maasai community. Selina now spends her time showing Maasai women how to grow spinach and other vegetables. But it takes a lot of effort to convince traditionally nomadic pastoralists to settle and farm. I have begun to think that uh, as Maasai community, we really need to have an alternative source of livelihood and nutrition security, food and nutrition security. And I thought, why not start crop farming instead of just having to do purely nomadic pastoralism? So now it's just important to try and diversify our sources of food and nutrition security and even sources of income because you see crops, you can, you can farm them at any time. Selina hopes to convince specifically younger women in the Maasai community because they'll be the ones bringing change to their families. For me, it's my generation that, the generation my age, that are the first ones to go to school to get a formal education. So it's up to us to educate the community and bring back the knowledge we have to share with them so that we can grow together. Otherwise, the whole population will be left behind if it's only the educated people who have the knowledge and the expertise and the only ones who can do like things. So we really have to share this knowledge and that is what we are doing now. While climate change is set to alter the Maasai's lifestyle dramatically, adapting to the changes could keep the communities going. Now I want to take you out of Kenya and broaden the view a little. See, climate change has really become a rallying cry for young people globally. In 2018, a Swedish teenager, Greta Thunberg, spearheaded the Fridays for Future movements, which saw students around the world demanding climate action from world leaders. While we haven't seen huge climate protests on the African continent compared, for example, to some other parts of the world, there are people who are working hard and dedicating their time to raising awareness and calling for climate justice. The only problem is that it's sometimes harder to make your voice heard here in Africa. And here's why. What do we want? Climate justice. What do we want? Vanessa Nakate. She has become the symbol of the Ugandan climate movement. The 24-year-old got involved in climate activism in 2018 after her country was hit by unusually high temperatures. Joining the worldwide climate protests, Vanessa camped with other activists in the freezing cold Switzerland at the World Economic Forum. Unfortunately, she didn't get the same attention that other activists got. She was cropped out of a published group photo and the incident went viral. In an online press statement, Nakata hit back at racism in the media. Other activists joined in solidarity, including Ndoni Ngunu from South Africa and Greta Thunberg from Sweden. You're focusing on climate activism uh, from different corners of you know, the Western countries, but what you're doing wrong is trying as much as possible to phase out and erase uh, the voices from the Global South. It makes us feel like the activism and the disasters in Africa wouldn't be a selling cake for you. But the incident didn't deter Vanessa from continuing her fight and drawing attention to climate change issues in Africa. What happened turned out to be a positive thing because of how we responded to it as activists from Africa. And uh, it has awakened most youth to stand up and rise up and demand for action, as well as awakened media and the public about the dangers of climate change. 
Before the pandemic, she also took her activism into the classroom. At this school in central Uganda, she wanted to inspire the next generation to get passionate about the environment. It's a message, she says, the children need to hear. To protect the trees. I believe that every kid deserves an opportunity to be in such a class, to clearly understand the importance of the things that they see in the environment. These kids understand. They clearly knew the importance of these trees. But if you come into that class and teach them and remind them, that keeps them alert and aware of the destruction that goes, as, that goes on in the environment and pushes them to conserve. Since the start of the pandemic, Vanessa has kept up her activism online. She's used her social platforms to draw attention to issues such as climate education, climate catastrophes and clean energy. Vanessa has also found her voice on an international stage. Leaders must acknowledge that we are in a crisis and start treating it as a crisis. The people and the planet must come first before anything else. If you do not treat climate change as a crisis, then you will not do what is necessary for us to get out of this mess. Vanessa believes that climate change is intrinsically tied to poverty, hunger and conflict. And she hopes that leaders, both at home, in Uganda and abroad, will act quickly enough to change things. The world produces more plastic than we need, and we see it everywhere, actually even all around me. In 2017, Kenya introduced one of the world's toughest laws against single-use plastic bags. In fact, you can even get fined for carrying one. Rwanda has gone a step further, and they've also banned plastic bottles, straws, and even coffee cups. And the reason for these measures is that most of the world's plastic ends up in landfills or oceans or places like these. It's estimated that by the year 2050, there will be more plastic weight in water than fish. So we asked our correspondents from across the continent how their countries have been dealing with plastic waste and management. Littering is illegal and city authorities try to target the culprits. There's currently no law that prevents people from using plastics or littering. Rwanda has successfully implemented anti-littering laws, but Zimbabwe still needs to do more. Like many emerging markets around the world, Nigeria is generating more waste than ever. This is because the population is growing and people are consuming more than they used to. Research shows that Nigeria is among the top 20 countries in the world with the largest share of plastic waste that ends up in the ocean. An estimated 200,000 metric tons of plastic waste is discharged from Nigeria into the Atlantic Ocean every year. Is Uganda's capital, Kampala, a clean city? That's a great topic of discussion. Well, it depends on where you are in Kampala. Some parts of the city are really clean, well maintained regularly. Others can reflect the exact opposite. It's common to see a plastic bottle being thrown out of a speeding car or dumping garbage in a drainage channel. But the city looks a bit much more organized than it was. Littering of any nature is a big challenge for Zimbabwe. Though anti-littering laws exist, the enforcement is very weak. If you go on the streets, there is hardly enough rubbish bins to throw litter, and people end up throwing litter anyhow. The end result is the recurrence of waterborne diseases like typhoid and cholera. Well, there you have it. There are not enough laws preventing people from littering. And in many cases, there are no proper waste uh, collection or management facilities provided by governments or cities who really should be picking them up. Luckily, there are always a few people who are willing to either volunteer or do something for their communities. So let's have a look. With its impressive skyline and expensive yachts, the lagoon in Lagos is a picture of luxury. But only at first glance, a closer look reveals the darker sides. The lagoon is a cesspool of plastic waste. A group of environmental activists called EcoPro is fighting against it. 
They've been collecting trash here since 2019 to protect the environment and the people who live here. The fishes in the water that we eat, they eat this and all of that. We are blocking our waterways. We are blocking the drainages. We are blocking the canals. At the end of the day, our streets will be flooded. We need to stop this. Look at everywhere. The activists go out once a week to clean up the lagoon. It's estimated that 12,000 metric tons of waste are dropped here every day. The NGO workers pay to rent the boat with their own money, but the owners give them a lower rate to help out. EcoPro also receives help from a private waste disposal company, which clears waste from the lagoon for free. Plastic is a recyclable material, but much of it still ends up in landfill. Recycling does exist here, but it's rudimentary. It's really just a dump site, but um, what we do have, we have pickers who go to the dump site and they then individually take out the things which have, they have a lot of value. I mean, we, we're literally throwing away money. They have a lot of value, so they pick them out and take them, they sell them off to the different people who are doing the recycling. Up to 100 workers help with the cleanups on a regular basis. The activists want to foster more public awareness about the environment to help change people's behavior. If only people can imbibe good culture whereby you drink it, you put it in your bag and trash it more later where you can find the trash can. EcoPro has also started to collect garbage on beaches. Sometimes they manage to recruit extra volunteers spontaneously. When I heard about this, I just felt that oh, this is a worthy cause to come be a part of. I could have been anywhere. I could have been at my factory, any of the stores all around Lagos, but come on, there's nothing like keeping Mother Nature. While the volunteers continue their work, they would like to see a reduction in waste, and they would like to see the government in Lagos stepping in and also doing its bit. Okay, I've got a question for you. What's your country doing about plastic waste? You know, we love hearing from you and you can always send us your comments via social media. But we already actually had some from our DW Facebook page and Martin Chiben from Nigeria wrote, climate change scares me and banning plastic will help us. I think I have to agree with you, Martin. And Uzondo Esionde from Ghana wrote, deforestation, damaging of water bodies due to illegal mining activities, lack of sufficient rainfall, sudden floods are just a few of the issues we face with our environment and changing climate in my area. Well, as usual, thank you so much for those comments. This show is really about all of us. And our next report actually comes from Ghana, where our team met another person protecting the environment. That's the up-and-coming musician Miriam Jalo. You may know her by her stage name, Mi J. So let's take a look. Miriam Jalo, or Mi J, has just started making a name for herself on Ghana's music scene. The young musician who has spent her life both in Sierra Leone and Ghana is passionate about her music. But she also has strong opinions about how we're treating our environment. Keeping green in our environment is, is just full of positive, but when you cut it down, it leads to pollution of air that enters directly to the soil. Water we drink, we use, the air we breathe, there will be just air pollution everywhere. So I believe if we keep our environment green, I mean, we are safe. The greenery is the backdrop for her music videos, and it's something she believes everybody should appreciate more. All of my videos that I've been using, the green in my video is just making my video beautiful. It's expressing love, it's expressing nature, you know. I'm strong because I've been weak. Well, that's all we have for you today. We do hope you enjoyed our special show right here from Lake Bogoria. Do get in touch with us and send us an email at 77 at dw.com and connect with us on social media. As usual, we leave you with a big tune. Thank you for watching. My night's wonder, you are gonna choose. My night's wonder, now you are gonna choose. Nobody gonna be take my mind, go. Nobody gonna be take my mind, no. Where you gonna go? Stay where I want to go, yeah. I don't know. Baby, carry me, go. If you leave, I go die, eh, Baby, carry me, go. No, say me, and you will be so. Baby, carry me, go. If you leave, I go die, eh, I'm done.
down, you are down, I'm down, we are down. But the girl like me wanna holla, holla for you, baby. Everybody needs someone to love, and my choice has always been you, my baby. Wanna take it and higher than the mall, you know me, you know me. I'm bad like that. Every movie night, it's a gun gas. I need you know me life, baby boy, that's all. Other boy me sing, cool, me go sing this song. The only wanna see boy, they my height up. My body on fire, go on to me, follow. Hold me tight, yeah, go on to me, follow. My king and my ruler, the only one, dada, for your. 